We will get started momentarily. We are just letting our room populate. Welcome everybody. As our room is populating, I just wanna give a couple of housekeeping notes about tonight's program. Everybody um, who is joining us tonight have been muted and our guest videos have been turned off so that we can focus on tonight's program. If you have a question for our speaker, please enter, enter your question using the Q&A on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Since our founding in 1913, ADL has always fought anti-Semitism and the right to establish fair and just treatment for all. Anti-Semitism and extremism, as we have reported, has not stopped or slowed down. As a matter of fact, it's on the rise and it has taken new forms. If you've been paying attention to the news, you probably sense that the number of extremist incidents and attacks have grown in the United States and that conspiracy theories and extremist ideology are more accepted than before. Communities across America and around the world are trying to figure out how so many people are being radicalized and why some are increasingly attracted to violent movements. Tonight, we will address these new and contemporary ways extremism is showing up in our community and how our youth are being recruited and radicalized. To get our program started, it is my pleasure to introduce Karen Westall, ADL Southwest Board Chair, who will introduce our speaker. And later she will be joined by Mark Tobin, ADL Southwest Regional Director, who will moderate our Q&A. Karen, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Margie. I too wanna to welcome everyone to ADL Southwest CEASE event. CEASE stands for Combating Extremism and Anti-Semitism Everywhere. This initiative is focused on providing resources and information to our community about how best to address anti-Semitism. Tonight, I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris. A professor at the American University in Washington, DC, Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris directs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, PERIL, in the Center for University Excellence. Her most recent book, Hate in the Homeland, The New Global Far Right, looks at the unexpected places where violent hate groups recruit young people. Dr. Miller Idris frequently testifies before the US Congress and regularly briefs policy, security, education, and intelligence agencies in the US, the United Nations, and other countries on trends in domestic violent extremism and strategies for prevention and disengagement. Dr. Miller Idris, thank you for joining ADL tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, although I, I always say I wish that what used to be my previously subcultural fringe research um, would have remained subcultural fringe research and had not become uh, relevant to the mainstream. But given that it is, I'm delighted to be here and, uh, and look forward to this. I'm going to share my screen and share some slides. Um, I have a couple of things to say about that. Um, uh, you'll note already just by what's on the screen, I'm gonna explain it to you in a few minutes, but that it includes offensive images and propaganda. Um, I am sharing images and propaganda that are um, directly targeting youth that come across often in the form of coded symbols or t-shirts or memes uh, or other kind of, in a lot of things that are in youth cultural spaces. Uh, I think it's necessary to do that for educational purposes, but I, um, I do ask that people not share them further. So sometimes people will screenshot because they are horrified by what they see or you know, interested in these strategies and then tweet it out, for example, um, and it has a way of amplifying the propaganda. So 
course for educational reasons, you're welcome to use it, um, but please don't share it over social media um, in a way that would further amplify. Just to give you a little bit of a roadmap of what I'm gonna talk about uh, for about a half hour here, um, I would like to cover uh, really briefly what's happening in far-right extremism, how that's defined, and then talk about what's happening in the modernization of this movement uh, among young people in particular. So one, the use of a really different use of symbols and codes uh, and a way of weaponizing youth culture. Uh, the second is a fragmentation of the spectrum, particularly around the left and the right, where uh, a theme of nature, I'm gonna give you as an example, where you're seeing uh, cross-cutting themes around um, anti-capitalism and, um, and uh, uh, environmental sustainability come out in strange ways and aligned with white supremacy. And the third, if I get to it, is uh, to talk about kind of a new physical space where it's appearing, a shift from what used to be in Europe called soccer hooliganism around soccer matches to uh, a, a co-opting of some aspects of the mixed martial arts. So really briefly, when I talk about radicalization, I won't go into a whole lot of academic definitions here, but what I'm really talking about is the process of coming to accept a way of thinking that positions us, an in-group versus an out-group versus the other in existential terms so that the other is seen as posing an existential threat, a dire threat to your way of life or your family or your future, often in a way that has to be thwarted with violence. So you have to act, you're called upon to act heroically to thwart that threat. Um, so that is very commonly in the white supremacist extremist scenes and movements expressed as a, a both anti-Semitism, but also a uh, threat again, of immigrants, of demographic change, any kind of um, uh, situation like that. But we also have male supremacism, um, incel violence. Uh, we have Christian supremacy. We have Western supremacy and so-called Western chauvinist Proud Boys, for example. So there's all different ways that this plays out across the spectrum. Of course, we also have the militia movement where the other is a supposedly tyrannical government. So happy to talk about any of that. But what I'm really going to focus on today is transformations in how youth in particular are experiencing and exposed to this. First, in terms of a much more bottom up and organic type of um, set of signals and codes, uh, weaponization of, of humor and satire and sarcasm and irony. Um, and then really a, a whole changing ecosystem of where people encounter these kinds of things. So I, again, I won't spend a lot of time on definitions, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, when I talk about the far right, I'm really talking about two broad trends. One is a set of supremacist beliefs that are exclusionary and dehumanizing, and the other is a set of anti-government or anti-democratic practices and ideals. I won't get into the drivers here, but happy to come back to it. There are a lot of different structural systematic elements, uh, individual vulnerabilities that make people more susceptible to this stuff. But what's important to know, I think, for right now is that across the West, which is defined, this is from a Global Terrorist Index figures, across the West, uh, over the last five years, we've seen a 250% increase in far-right terrorist incidents. That's across uh, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, North America. And it's really important to note that the United States um, takes the brunt of that. So about half of the incidents and about half of the deaths occur in the United States. Uh, in 2019 in particular, um, uh, that which is the most recent data that the GTI has, the Global Terrorism Index, uh, deaths from far-right terror um, represented 82% of deaths in the West. Now, Islamist terror still represents the majority of lethality worldwide. But when we're talking about um, largely stable countries in the West, uh, the far right terrorism has exceeded the Islamist threat within the North American context and the US context. In Europe, it's a little more complicated. It's growing rapidly, but jihadi terrorism still is ahead in terms of the threat. Um, all of this led has finally been recognized in the US. It's been going on for a while, as you're probably aware. Um, but in October 2020, and then in spring 2021, um, after January 6, both the US Department of Homeland Security and then the Office of the Director of the National Intelligence declared, uh, explained that uh, you know, there is an ongoing and escalating threat from domestic violent extremism and positioned white supremacist extremists 
uh, as the most pressing and lethal threat in the homeland in that DHS report. In the ODNI report, they also name unlawful militias, uh, specifically noting that law enforcement and um, elected officials are at risk from, from those while civilians and targeted minorities are at risk from the white supremacist extremists. One of the things that's really important to note is that uh, across, the, across these worldwide terrorist events, only about 13% of global far-right terror is attributable back to a member of a specific group. And that's true, attributable back to a group at all. And that's true also of, of the terror that we've seen in the US. So uh, even on January 6, um, of the arrests that were made on January 6, which is a broader issue, not just white supremacist extremism, but uh, those arrests, only about 16 or 17% uh, of those arrests have been uh, people who are affiliated with groups. So we're much more facing a sort of online radicalization of individuals who are sometimes uh, self-radicalizing networks, meaning they're not totally isolated. They're picking up on propaganda produced by groups, but they are not card-carrying members of those groups. And that's a massive change. So again, I won't go into depth, too much depth here about the symbols themselves, but as I just to explain as I go into the use of codes and symbols, um, I just want to say that although you know extremist groups have always used symbols and logos, of course we know uh, the Nazis themselves used the swastika and any number of other Nordic symbols, for example, and other symbols. But the types of symbols are changing now. The way that they're shared, the way that they're created, the use of wit and humor, and where they are shared. All of those things have been transformed very, very quickly. So again, with, with uh, my apologies for some of the propaganda here, I'm just gonna give you a couple of different examples um, drawn from the chapters of the book that I'm talking about here. In the lower left-hand corner, this is a still from a German vegan neo-Nazi cooking show on, uh, that ran on YouTube for some time. We have um, DIY shows in construction, handyman kind of stuff. We have, there's a makeup uh, tutorial um, that is Islamophobic, um, you know, where, where people are integrating extremist, anti-Semitic, racist, uh, Islamophobic, xenophobic ideas into ordinary types of hobbies, for example. We see in the upper two images, lots of propaganda in paper flyers, often targeting college campuses, the ADL, documented a more than doubling of that just in the year 2020 to well over uh, 5,100 incidents now. Um, during the pandemic, it shifted off of college campuses just into public domains, and I know that's recently hit Houston as well. Most of that is white supremacist, anti-immigrant, some misogynistic as well. Um, in the upper two corners, you see some images from the mixed martial arts scenes that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And in the lower right, uh, this is an Instagram account, and there are you know, I, I picked this one because we're seeing a lot of aesthetic shifts in the way that images are used. This is a, a European one in German, but they're using English. They're using aesthetically pleasing images that tell people to defend their land, to not um, mix racially with others. Uh, often there are children, there's usually a blonde woman, you know, standing in a field of wheat or in a wood with like dappled light and a little deer. Um, you know, often with really pretty flowers around them. I mean, so aesthetically curated and very attractive images, but then with these very exclusionary messages. The kind of coding that I study, this is in Europe um, from about a decade ago in Germany, but it carried over into the US. So I'm gonna show you uh, about um, uh, 10 years ago now, 11 years ago, the equivalent of the highest German court uh, ruled that Nazi symbols are no longer illegal if they're in a language other than German um, for complicated reasons that had to do with the police's ability to detect what that language was and what the symbol meant. So something like the swastika where it is illegal to have the word Hakenkreuz or swastika written in, in, in words. So that launched a whole bunch of um, coded products and clothing and use of codes. So this is the word swastika in Latvian on the back of this sweatshirt, Swastika European Brotherhood. You know, one of the things I wanted to point out is this is 76 euros, uh, which is, you know, probably about 80, $85, not cheap um, for just a sort of cotton sweatshirt. It has a whole section here, if anybody speaks German, that tells you about the quality of the cotton and the zipper and all the, the pockets and how great they are. 
But the very first line says, rechtlich absolut unbedenklich, which means perfectly legal. So they're, they're marketing the legality of this at the same time as they are um, trying to sell a product. That type of coding expanded into, this is a distributor um, in France, that if you sound out the name of the distributor, it's 2YT for you, too white for you. Then they sell, uh, they sell products from, I can see the logos here from Ukraine, from Poland, um, from a uh, uh, French brand, a German brand. Um, there are a number of other brands here. They have children's clothing. You'll see in the lower uh, uh, image there, a t-shirt that drops the vowels out because of that um, coding that I, that I mentioned that was happening. Uh, I don't have an image here. I was hoping I had it in the slide deck, but I don't of uh, the same use of the word swastika would happen right before this image Hitler with the uh, words, with the letters dropped out, the vowels is that uh, a man showed up at a protest in Dortmund in 2016 wearing a t-shirt that used the Run DMC logo, which was an American uh, sort of rap group from the 1980s, used that logo and put the word for Hakenkreuz for swastika in the logo with the vowels removed. So it just said H-K-N-K-R-Z. That created an entire legal discussion about whether a word is still a word if the vowels are removed. The legal determination was that it is not a word and therefore legal. And so that created again, uh, additional game playing. So you can sort of see how this, for a scholar of semiotics like me, a, a cultural sociologist, um, it's been fascinating and disturbing, but also part of it's very clearly linked to the way that the bands themselves created a kind of backlash effect with a game playing culture. And so that's something I wanna talk about perhaps in question and answer around social media and uh, the impact of banning and deplatforming and how that can fuel some of the creativity inadvertently. So the second thing I wanted to talk about, uh, so that's the, some of the coding and, and uh, I'm gonna come back to that again. So just stay with that for a minute, but that just explains a little bit about how the coding is happening. I'm going to talk about the fragmentation and then return to the weaponization of youth culture. When I talk about the fragmentation, you know, one of the things that's happening because of the way that people encounter propaganda and disinformation and hateful content online is so fragmented now. They pick it up in little bits and pieces and it comes to them in the form of, of memes or videos or texts and all kinds of different ways that they encounter on on different social media sites, instead of just reading a coherent text, like a manifesto or an ideological treatise or a racist or white supremacist novel. So we're seeing a lot more fragmentation and reassembling of ideologies in strange ways. And so one of those is what we call ecofascism, which is the use of environmental claims or issues of environmental sustainability to justify white supremacist extremism and anti-immigrant, extreme anti-immigrant sentiment. So we see this um, in the El Paso shooting that happened a few years ago. Uh, he was an eco-fascist who talked about the need to close the borders. Uh, there wasn't going to be enough space, literally. I mean, it's racial entitlement to the land. Talked about the Native Americans as a cautionary tale, that they were um, driven onto reservations by immigrants and um, and ultimately that's where the kind of concept of white genocide is tied to so but a lot of this um, rationale comes in integrated in ideas of nature uh, it is really at its origins tied back to this idea of blood and soil um, that the Nazis had so embedded in their belief system which was uh, again I, an idea of racial entitlement to the land um, and it's using climate change and fears about climate change to recruit and draw people in with claims about anti-immigration and protection of white people and their space. Um, it, there you see a lot of language of roots and belonging and nature. And even in these t-shirts, for example, um, a kind of worship of nature itself and arguing that nature you know, doesn't care in this case of this t-shirt, nature doesn't care about equality, that the natural order of things includes inferiority and superiority, that things are Darwinian. Um, and so a lot of these, these leaning into ideas about nature as a way of justifying hierarchies 
of superiority and inferiority in addition to making the environmental sustainability claims. So I promised I'd come back to that weaponization of youth culture. When, so when you see all these things, you understand the fragmentation, the way that people encounter propaganda and disinformation and hateful content online in little bits of ways, reassemble them into new ways. We also have this thing happening, which has been happening for about the last decade or so, which I call the weaponization of youth culture. Others have called it uh, that as well, which is especially youth who are, you know, believe themselves to be in or identify with the far right or with other parts of the white supremacist extremist movement, position themselves as edgy, as, as countercultural against the mainstream, as being provocative and as triggering, as intentionally triggering um, a, a group of sort of liberal mainstream folks who just can't take a joke. So everybody else is just a triggered liberal um, and they're the edgy countercultural ones. So you'll see t-shirts that say things like, you know, we're not radical, we're just early. You're using, I'm gonna talk about Pepe the Frog in a minute, but this t-shirt Pepe Fiction, this is an Austrian brand, by the way. So this is a global phenomenon, right? Um, and uh, it is a way of positioning themselves as edgy. So the Pepe the Frog, um, most people are familiar with this meme, uh, you know, so this shift from t-shirt iconography to online memes that we've saw, seen over the last four or five years in particular. Um, one of the reasons why it's so appealing to youth is because it removes the producer entirely. Anybody can create a meme and so, and you can create and recreate and continue to evolve. You don't have to wait for someone to create a t-shirt with a clever or witty thing. You can just do it yourself. So Pepe the Frog became co-opted by uh, white supremacists who put him in a variety of offensive uh, Nazi and Ku Klux Klan and other racist imagery. But then somebody discovered for complicated reasons that the, the, the letters K-E-K -E um, are used in place of LOL in some online gaming, which has to do with how some global keyboards work. So Kek, uh, K-E-K -E stands in for LOL. Someone discovered that there's an Egyptian god of the frogs named uh, Kek. And so they, they deemed Lord Kek is the, the ruler of a fantastical mythical land called Kekistan. All sounds ridiculous. They made a flag, right? So this flag, Kekistan, it's, you know, Pepe is Lord Kek, is the ruler over Kekistan, this sort of mythical um, white supremacist uh, fantasy land. Except then that flag actually starts to show up places in real life. So it started by a bunch of teenagers online as a joke, as a meme, as an offensive thing. And then people start to actually take this flag out. So you see it up here on the left in Charlottesville. In, in the bottom, it's at a far right demonstration in Brazil. In the center, at the top, it's in London. Um, we've seen it on uh, memes and iconography about Australia and other countries. And here in the middle, it's that's that's January 6th. That's at the U.S. Capitol. So, you know, on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol, an insurrection, you have the Kekistan flag waving, which is basically a symbol of a white supremacist fantasy ethnostate of some kind, created out of a meme made by teenagers essentially online as a joke that they thought was being edgy and provocative, but then actually turns into a sign of in-person, real-life activism. This is what sometimes was referred to as a meme war. And we saw it with the Boogaloo scenes as well. Again, that's a meme created, a joke created by teenagers. Boogaloo stands for, it's a stand in for civil war. Um, it's a word that was taken from a widely panned uh, sequel to a breakdancing movie in the mid 1980s. And somebody, so it became a word that meant the second of anything. And somebody then started using it to refer to a second civil war and uh, created a meme around it, a boogaloo. And then whole groups started to form around it. Facebook shut down the boogaloo. It starts to change its into other words, big igloo, big luau. Big luau, as you see in the upper center, becomes popular because it features pig roasts, which are is a slur against the police then. And you see this ATF. So they start wearing Hawaiian shirts to reference the big luau. And those Hawaiian shirts start showing up at protests everywhere, uh, along with the boogaloo. And then you see this kind of idea that there's mimetic warfare or meme-based insurgency. So you see this in the center here with this revolutionary iconography, the uh, you know stripes of a flag with the Hawaiian iconography on it, um, the, the semi-automatic machine gun, 
and the task force Igloo reference to the Boogaloo, which is itself a reference to a second civil war or a coming civil war. So your minds are probably spinning right now, the ridiculousness of this all. But again, so the Boogaloo, uh, Boogaloo affiliated groups allegedly were responsible for several murders in the summer of 2020. Um, they are, uh, have, you know, they're, they're complicated because they don't, they're not like groups the same way that ISIS is a group, right? There's no hierarchy, there's no cells, there's no chain of command, but groups form around them and then have undertaken violent and even terrorist action. So it's a much more difficult landscape to explain, particularly in the counterterrorism space or counter extremism space, because you have to understand youth culture first, but understand that youth culture in ways that a lot of people would look at this and say, this is just a joke has real consequences for what's happening in the offline world. So uh, just to sum up that bit of it, then I'm gonna try to leave you with, with a little bit more hope. Um, so in sum, and I could go on about this forever because uh, to, to, I just touched on one small part of it, which is the coding, the weaponization of youth culture and the way that symbols are used. Um, but that we've seen massive transformations in the pace and scope, how symbols change, how quickly they evolve in ways that make it very difficult for parents, teachers, youth mentors, youth group leaders, others um, to keep up, right? We're seeing a fragmentation in the traditional themes that draw people into some of these movements. So environmental change and sustainability motivating into immigration in ways that would have been very difficult to wrap our heads around even a few years ago. Big changes in where youth encounter extremist ideas. I would say this is also equally true for adults. So if extremist ideas used to be a destination that you had to seek out or had to be invited into, the assumption I make now is that everyone encounters it at some point that this information, that propaganda, that hateful content crosses your screen, shows up in an online gaming chat room, comes into a video, that you weren't expecting to uh, encounter because you clicked on a recommendation from an algorithm. I mean, all those kinds of ways, it's much more likely that it comes to you. As I've sometimes explained it, everyone's just a couple of clicks away from whole worlds of disinformation and hate. And we're not really equipped yet to know how to deal with that. Finally, and I pointed this out just a few minutes ago, but I think it's worth reiterating, a lot of people dismiss youth culture I had an early reviewer for my last book um, for the research I was going to do for it who said I was being alarmist and said, you know, I was talking about t-shirts and these coded symbols. And he said in the review, he, I'm assuming maybe she said, you know, I was a punk in the eighties and I grew out of it. You know, don't you think they'll just grow out of it? And um, I had to, I realized I had to explain in greater depth why I think even if they do grow out of it, why there's damage that can be done, um, in part because of how this online youth cultural world connects in many ways to offline violence. That playful use of irony and wit on top of all that makes it fun for youth. And there's a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of ways that we, we tend to think of this as just hateful experiences for them, but there are a lot of positive things that youth in particular get out of joining these movements, a sense of contributing to something bigger and better than themselves, a call to action. They seem to seek and find a sense of meaning. Um, and often they find it fun to troll adults or to get a sense of power over others that they sometimes aren't experiencing in their own lives. So um, I can talk about that a little bit. It's also strategic for them. They avoid bans and dress codes and stigma. And we very clearly see that in the German case, which has a lot more restrictions and censorship than we do in the States. Um, but we have also seen it here in the U.S. when uh, marchers coming to Charlottesville to the Unite the Right rally in 2017 were instructed to come and look, dress respect, respectably, um, so that people would be more likely to listen to their ideas. So there are some strategic and kind of instrumental reasons for some of these transformations. So I do want to say something about um, what can be done. So I run a research lab where all we do is test interventions and try to provide evidence of what works. Um, we are partnered with the Southern Poverty Law Center on creating a whole series of tools for parents, for caregivers, um, for uh, teachers. We're doing one now for um, coaches and other adults, youth mentors, what we call extracurricular adults, the adults that are not the parents or teachers, but also work closely with young people. 
Um, and so we're creating a series of tools. We think that improving awareness, ADL actually just also reduced, uh, released a, a very good toolkit for parents. Um, so all these resources I'm sure can be dropped into the chat or sent out afterward. I'm happy to provide links. Um, but improving awareness of what we call frontline caregivers, frontline responders um, to better recognize how to, um, you know, what some, what are some of these changes are if, if somebody says it at your dinner table or in your classroom, but also how to work in a more proactive way to prevent it. So one of the things that we learned in focus groups with parents, for example, as we were creating our first toolkit for parents was that parents didn't want just advice on how to recognize the risk. They were also asking for ways to build resilience. And so we, we dug in and worked on a lot of more positive kind of resilience uh, based strategies that we offer in this toolkit around helping kids assert more control over their lives, um, thinking about um, kindness and empathy and how to have a sense of purpose and meaning even in difficult and uncertain times when they might be seeking out clearer black and white kind of answers. Uh, I write a lot and I'm happy to talk about this um, in the Q&A as well. I write a lot about the need for a public health approach, um, which involves uh, to, to countering all of this, which involves kind of understanding that the way that we treat disease like diabetes or cardiac disease in this country um, uh, is not just by treating the symptoms of the disease, but by investing in communities earlier with education about the behavioral and attitudinal changes that people can make that make them less susceptible to those diseases later on. And so if you think of hate as a virus, if you think of disinformation as a virus, and instead of just targeting the fringe, that we actually also have to work to build resilience to everybody in the mainstream to the fringe, um, that's the kind of approach that we're taking. It involves um, deep education to counter some of the racism, the xenophobia, the misogyny, the anti-Semitism that we're encountering, but also real skills to recognize propaganda and disinformation and conspiracy theories when you see them. Um, so some of that is just digital literacy. I often ask policymakers uh, to call on more multi-sectoral approaches. So we need more Department of Education and Department of Health and Human Services and not just Department of Homeland Security involved in these kinds of approaches uh, to do research and fund interventions. Almost all of our funding comes from private uh, donors and um, and, uh, and foundations, because I think they're, they're ahead of the curve. Um, the government tends to move more slowly. Uh, I can talk later about the issues of regulation and the, the needs of local communities, which I obviously, the CEASE uh, initiative and your local offices are already very deeply involved in. Um, I think that's the end, yes. So there's a, uh, just to say that I have um, our website, which, Needs, needs updating and construction, but the website has a lot of these tools linked. Um, and my own personal website has most of my um, essays, so a recent essay uh, in the New York Times and uh, in MSNBC this month, on um, both on January 6th and on the anti-Semitism involved in the uh, Texas synagogue um, hostage crisis, for example, uh, you might be interested in. But there's a lot of other stuff there. I also frequently tweet about these issues and more. Um, so I will stop there. I think I'm more or less on time. Hopefully we have time for plenty of questions. You, you are great for time, Cynthia. Thank you so much for that terrific presentation and looking forward to, uh, to the question and answer uh, part of this webinar. Uh, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, put them in the, in the chat link. Um, one, uh, one key thing that is going to be putting in the chat is that, uh, there will be a 30% off code for your most recent book, Hate in the Homeland. And, uh, it's a terrific read and I hope that people take advantage of that. Uh, you're, you, you published an essay in the New York Times as a guest essayist on January 5th, one day before the first year anniversary. And it, it really was, uh, terrific. It was very fresh. Uh, and it, it built on this concept, which you just talked about towards the end of your remarks about a public health approach to helping resolve this issue with right wing extremism. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I think there are, there are a couple of different things that are involved in a public health approach, um, but it is it gets back to that issue of um, 
rooting interventions in the needs of communities and in a much, much earlier engagement in the preventative work to reduce the fertile ground um, that allows extremist ideologies to thrive. So I will say that in this country, we have almost exclusively focused on, uh, even when we talk about prevention in, in what I would call secondary prevention, what DHS calls secondary prevention, which is, and I, I don't wanna say it's not important. We saw very, very clearly in the hostage taking crisis, how important that kind of prevention is. It is the training of what to do in a crisis. I sometimes refer to it as, you know, uh, you know, our measure of success comes down to how good we've become at barricading the door. Um, it is not the measure of success I want to use for prevention, but it's not to say that we don't need to know how to barricade the door either. We obviously need that kind of training. And um, so it's, but it's not just that. I think, you know, my concern about the securitized approach compared to a public health approach is that it's like that frog in the water that keeps getting hotter and hotter, you know, and doesn't notice that it's in a boil. It just, it always builds on itself and we become ever more accustomed to a world in which I live in Washington DC and after January 6th, I mean, the whole city shut down. We had military checkpoints on the bridges and I actually changed my mind about going across to Virginia to go for a hike because I didn't want to deal with the traffic waiting in line at the military checkpoint to get back into the city where I live. And you know, a lot of people in the world live in those environments and have had to suffer from those kinds of securitized worlds. Um, and what I would like to do is see us prevent more of that from coming, fewer people going into the pipeline. So we don't need those tools at the far end of it. And a public health approach is, is really focused on those reducing the fertile ground through civic education, through anti-racist work, through um, really unpacking a lot of those prejudices and supremacist ways of thinking that uh, make for receptive ground, but also really just very teachable skills around digital literacy, source integrity, media literacy. How do you recognize propaganda? You know, it turns out, as we found in research, there's, there's a pretty clear scaffold to, especially anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which are you know, ubiquitous in this space. Um, there's always a cabal of elites, they're always trying to get power. You know, there's always like, there's basically, you can trace it out, it's a formula. And once you see it, then you're like, doesn't matter if it's about a vaccine or about, you know, an assassination of Princess Diana or whatever the conspiracy itself is, that same scaffold is there. And it turns out that if you teach people about the scaffold, this is research that's about to be published, they can recognize it when they see it again and they realize it's a conspiracy. So that's a kind of public health approach is investing in a much earlier stage. And, and you know, we talk about the concerns that we have over the normalization of anti-Semitism and hate. Uh, we know from history uh, where things go once, once hate and anti-Semitism become uh, normal, that people just become used to hearing and listening and not doing anything about it. Uh, but, you know, looking at history, the, your approach is sort of public health approach. There is a historical precedent for, for pursuing this, this approach, correct? There are a couple of historical precedents. Um, so, you know, I would say the, well, there's a recent historical precedent, which is the move of gun violence funding uh, into the National Institute of Health and, and Health and Human Services. So that's one example of the public health approach, which is literally moving the funding to understand the roots of gun violence and treat it as a public health problem. And so this is the kind of, can we treat extremism and rising extremist violence, um, particularly on the domestic violent extremist spectrum in the far right, um, which is what we're, where we're seeing so many of the increases in the states as a public health problem in the same way. And, you know, that, that's relatively new within a decade um, that that move, um, that appropriation and move of gun violence to a public health approach was made. And it's too soon to say if it's been effective, um, but in other words, we can't just treat gun violence through the law enforcement lens and arrest, we can't arrest or ban our way out of this entirely, right? Um, last year, there were 110 domestic extremist um, attacks and 21 of them were foiled. And, and that, was so, in the, that was in the United States alone, correct? And then in the United States alone, right. And only 21 were foiled. So, you know, 
we're lucky that those other ones were not bigger, that they didn't have greater lethality. Um, but I don't want to be just lucky, right? I want us to be better at not having so many that have to be perfectly um, uh, interrupted just in the nick of time. I, you know, one question that was posed, which I, I think people often uh, wonder is how can an individual recognize signs of, of a person that they know or that they see on social media or somewhere in the, in the walk of life that they are becoming radicalized? What are kind of some of the uh, clues that, that have become apparent that you're like, you know, this is a real issue here? One of the things we often tell parents uh, is that the kind of warning signs and red flags that we point to are, um, they're very similar to some, some of them are very similar to the warning signs of, of kids who are being groomed for other reasons um, or being uh, uh, recruited or groomed um, by predators uh, that they become sometimes more withdrawn, more secretive. They, um, they might disengage, change their friendship patterns, um, not suddenly not get along with other friends. Um, they're sharing things. Sometimes they will do, especially in early stages with their parents, depending on the relationship they have or with their siblings, share a text link to a YouTube video or early things that are offensive or strange or uh, conspiracy theory oriented. So there's some of those are just the same kinds of red flags that a parent might get uh, if there was an addiction or any other kind of problem going on with a child where you think that, you know, something is off. That's what we often hear from a parent. Something was off. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if they were, um, you know, being bullied or if they were being, you know, they just, they knew something was wrong, but they couldn't quite tell what it was. So that's one thing to look out for is the same kinds of things that you would worry about with other types of self-harm or um, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. But another thing is where you can't quite tell specifically, I would say, if, if they're being radicalized directly. But what the way I like to think of it is there are some red flags that they're being exposed to the content. And so you know that if they're saying certain things, and this often we'll, we'll hear parents say, um, you know, we had a parent say to me uh, that all of a sudden during the pandemic, their son started um, just saying things like, um, women, you know, women shouldn't be working, right? Or like just, you know, just things that he wouldn't have said before. Like, where was he getting these ideas? It's kind of some misogynistic types of things that women belong in the, in the home or, you know, uh, that um, girls aren't as smart as boys at math, like, but just worse than that, right? And I really mean in misogynistic things. And then when she would try to argue with him and he'd say, well, you're a woman, you wouldn't understand, right? So she didn't know where to go with it and was asking us for help. and. Um, and, you know, what I was saying is I, I can't tell you that he's being radicalized, but I, I can tell you there's, it's very clear he's reading content somewhere. He's encountering content somewhere. If that's not coming from the home, he's running into it somewhere. And so often there are things like they'll suddenly mention a conspiracy theory, say something about the vaccine, um, say something that about a triggered snowflake, right? Something that just tells you they've encountered a phrase or a meme or something online that's like, hey, what do you mean by that? I actually, I heard that something. I saw something like that online. And so we always advise parents to react with curiosity if you can. It can be very hard to do that. Um, but rather than shame, because if you initially react with shame when they say something offensive to your values, um, it can drive them online further where that shame gets converted into even more anger. Oh, yeah, thank you for those suggestions. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, when we chatted before uh, the webinar, you mentioned that there are a whole host of new resources available to help people uh, understand, to respond uh, to this rise in extremism. Um, and, and one of them actually involves um, our colleague, Warren Siegel, who is vice president and uh, for the, our Center on Extremism, which I know you work with. Um, and so shamelessly, I, if you wouldn't mind just giving a quick plug for that, but also yes. talk about these other resources that are, that are generally available and why do you think uh, they finally found uh, recipients and found an audience? Yeah, I think we're, thanks for the question. It's a terrific one. And I think we're in a, a sea change moment in, in suddenly seeing a lot of resources come out in this field in ways that's terrific. Um, so I'm really, really pleased to be able to say a year ago, I would have answered this really, really differently. But 
uh, so the ADL just came out with a great toolkit um, for, I think it's for parents and caregivers. Um, we have our guide for parents and caregivers to online radicalization, which is with the Southern Poverty Law Center. And we're all friends and colleagues and cross promote each other's work. And we all hang out at the well, same it's meetings. All good. It's all good. It's all good. It's great. It's great work. Um, so I'm not going to say one's better than the other or not. They're all, we need more and we need more of it. And, and it's all useful in reaching different audiences um, and designed in slightly different ways with different emphases. Uh, so we have a whole suite and we're translating those globally. So we've released them in Portuguese because we've had some Brazilian colleagues ask for resources in Spanish. They got released in German this week. We've now had requests for Turkish and Norwegian. Um, so our resources for parents and caregivers, teachers, mental health counselors, coaches, and youth are all being released. The other thing we're doing is testing them all, both in short term and longitudinally. So what's quite interesting about our parents guide, for example, we tested it with 750 parents. And one of the things we, so it, it improved everyone's ability to recognize uh, propaganda and disinformation and to feel more empowered that they would act if they knew a child who had been exposed, except for one group on one measure, which is gonna be really interesting, I think, to this audience. The most educated group of parents in our study did not improve their ability to recognize disinformation uh, as a result of our intervention. And the reason why is because they came in so much more confident than everybody else that they could already do it. And then basically declined in their ability to, you know, their, their confidence went down because they saw how much more coded it is and clever and hard to recognize um, in the ways that it comes across its screens that they got less confidence. So we saw that as really important in two ways. One, it corrected their overconfidence that they already knew how to do it, which they had. And I say this as an overeducated you know, parent myself, like that you, that you just, this, we, we kind of tend to do that. But also um, it, uh, it showed us that those parents were never gonna look for these resources on their own, that we needed a different kind of messaging to reach edu highly educated parents uh, about the fact that their kids are not immune just because they have highly educated parents necessarily, um, that they might just be just as susceptible. So, you know, so the, those set of resources are there. And the last thing I'll say, um, the Western State Center, which is a fantastic uh, inclusive democracy organization based up in the Pacific Northwest, has built a website around my book um, and I'm donating the proceeds uh, a portion of those paperback sales back to them. They are, they built a reader's guide with uh, scenarios for teachers with a glossary of terms. And that's at Western State Center backslash uh, oh, hate in the homeland. So we're seeing, they, they read the book, their uh, um, president and CEO, uh, Eric Ward, and, and really just wanted it to be accessible to practitioners and to parents and communities. And so commissioned this uh, guide separately. And then Princeton put it in the paperback uh, edition, they put an abridged version in the back and that's free for everybody. There's no cost, it's all downloadable. So uh, there are quite a few resources I think coming out now in ways that hopefully will be, uh, make these, this kind of knowledge more translatable to, to folks um, who, are, who are spend time with youth, which is almost everybody, right? Sure, and, and, that's, and that's so important. But I think from what you're telling us is that it is also extremely important that um, those who have the information be proactive about putting it out because while I'm sure a lot of people are looking around saying, okay, there's something wrong happening, uh, they're not then going to necessarily seek it out themselves. It needs a little bit of prompting. That's right. I think prompting and, and reflective time to think about it. And you know, one of the ways that I, I sometimes talk about this is that um, you know, we have seen that, you know, some people have more immunity than others because of their own religious background or racial background, but no one is immune to all forms of, of discrimination and prejudice. And so I think, you know, we've seen, um, you know, strange things happen with, uh, you know, um, people of color being a part of the Proud Boys, these Western chauvinists. And so, you know, it's not just a clear, it's not, it, that's why I think it's important to talk about supremacist mindsets and to think about how do we combat them across the board. And there are some common threads that run through. Anti-Semitism is one of them, misogyny is another, um, where you see them kind of across the board and even across ideologies, like on the Islamist side as well, um, and in the left and left-wing terrorism and extremism as well. 
Um, but it's not, uh, it's not that it's, you know, sometimes people think like, oh, this won't affect uh, my community or couldn't affect my child. And, and I think that's one of the things we are hoping to help people understand that, that everyone is vulnerable to this kind of persuasive stuff online, although some people less vulnerable than others. You talked about the fact that um, a lot of your material is translated in different languages. Um, one question um, posed a query, which is something that, you know, I think has been in sort of the, the public debate for, for a, a while now, which is, are other either governments or other entities using this opportunity of fomenting extremism um, as a means of, of challenging our democratic institutions and ultimately the ability for, for democracies to, to be democratic? Yeah, I think, you know, so I would say there are several other countries that are ahead of us in terms of recognizing this threat from the domestic side. Um, Canada is, is really embedding the counter-extremism work within the fight against racism. They've just appointed a sort of national commissioner on Islamophobia, for example. Um, New Zealand also after Christchurch has done a huge lift on creating a, ways to integrate issues of social inclusion and diversity with the fight against countering violent extremism. Germany, of course, in its post-World War II and post-Holocaust era has, has invested the most um, in this public health approach and has really tried to, within its defense of democracy approach, in other words, arguing that you can't just combat the fringe, but you have to, um, you have to educate everybody to be more resilient against the propaganda and persuasive efforts that come from the fringes. Uh, and they just stood up a three million, a three, a three billion um, euro, one billion euro initiative over three years, sorry, is the figure, uh, called the 89 measures to combat racism and right-wing extremism, which combats anti-Semitism, racism, and right-wing extremism all at once. And um, that's really different than the way that we approach it in the States, obviously, which is a much more securitized uh, framework. I do think that there's, change. I mean, by, the Biden administration released its first national strategy on countering domestic terrorism in June, and they mentioned the public health approach, and they mentioned the need to combat issues of structural racism. Um, so there are an anti-Semitism and, and xenophobia comes up as well. So they, this is a real, that's a real sea change to see that in print, to see that from an administration, but we haven't seen any implementation. As one person described it, it's been crickets ever since um, and that's, they've got a lot going on with the COVID and pandemic and other things, but January 6th, but um, there hasn't really been uh, any clear implementation plan yet for that national strategy. So it's, I th I'd say we're sort of at like real baby steps in this country on what's going to happen. And tomorrow morning, uh, you will be on Capitol Hill uh, testifying um, along with uh, ADL's uh, CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt. What are you going to tell members of Congress? So I am going to tell, I'll be testifying at 10 a.m. It's live streamed um, both from the House Homeland Security Committee's website and from uh, on YouTube, I think, um, C-SPAN maybe. Uh, that is a hearing on trends in domestic terrorism. And I will be talking about some of the things I just talked to you about, which is the fragmentation and the, and the growing convergence across the Salafi Jihadi and the far right spectrum around core themes like anti-Semitism and misogyny um, and the way that this, what I sometimes call facetiously a little bit, the choose your own adventure nature of the way people pull together bits and fragments of ideology and then assemble it anew. So this eco-fascism, we now have a white supremacist group that calls themselves Bolshevist uh, white supremacists. They're uh, calling for the liquidation of the capitalist classes. I mean, really strange uh, hybrid kind of and fragmented types of things. And so I will call, I will describe it briefly and we really get a few minutes for oral testimony and then um, really call on this public health approach and the need for earlier prevention and investments in prevention and not just in the security apparatus. Um, most of what's interesting in those hearings comes in the question and answer and there's no way to predict what that will be. Um, so there are four of us as witnesses, uh, and it's talking about the whole landscape. So there will also be some discussion of Al-Qaeda and 
ISIS and Islamic State as well. Uh, but my role is to talk about the domestic violence side. And, and we know that right wing extremism and terrorism is not the only form. Uh, there are issues on, on the left as well uh, and other forms of international terrorism. Um, but I, it's interesting how you talk about sort of a, uh, I don't know if, if the right term is a, a merging of, is it either the ideology or is it the end result? Yeah, it, actually, I think it's even earlier than the ideology. I sometimes call it blurriness, which is, um, or muddled ideologies. And it's, it is uh, sometimes on the end result as well, um, because you, you see a coming together across groups around the low, lowest common denominator, like we did on January 6th, where they could be mobilized, even though they're actual the aims of the Proud Boys and white supremacists and unlawful militias, they would normally never be in the same place with QAnon. You know, they, there was just a really a motley group of people who normally wouldn't be aligned, but they agreed on that day about the lowest common denominator for them, which was they believed that the election was illegitimate and they could fight uh, you know, a, a, what they believed to be a tyrannical government. So we're seeing that. So there is some end result kind of convergence in that sense, uh, or some examples of that uh, also with uh, coalitions, let's say of anti-vaxxers and anti-government extremists coming together as we've seen. Um, but mostly what I'm talking about is, is a kind of growing convergence or overlap or blurriness almost at the pre-ideology side. So it's not that there's a clear ideology, it's these, these bits of things that people start to draw upon before it even gets to a fully fledged ideology. So they're not talking about fascism or communism or anarchism as an ideological set of beliefs that's bounded and fixed and has a clear way of thinking that's rooted in history. It's they're, they're sort of pulling it together in strange ways as they encounter this. And so there are themes that cut across them like uh, beliefs in supremacism, core beliefs in anti-Semitism, uh, core support for traditional family structures and heteronormativity. That comes across the ISIS and Islamist side, Al-Qaeda side, Salafi Jihadism, and across the far right. Far left is still there and I think it has grown uh, over the last year as well. Um, not at the level, certainly not the lethality of far right and not at the level of what's happened in the far right, uh, according to all the intelligence assessments. But, you know, as we know from the 70s and 80s, we have had episodes where far right terrorism was the highest, in fact, in the country and, and, and uh, in many parts of the world. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't advocate for um, taking our eye off the ball on any form of terrorism or extremism. At the same time, I think we need to be thinking about a different kind of interventions that get at the root of some of the disinformation wherever it comes from. Thank you, and I wish you the best of luck uh, tomorrow. It's, uh, you have an important chore uh, in thank front you. of you. Um, I want to thank everybody who submitted uh, questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all um, as we're out of time. Um, I want to thank the Edith and Sydney Goldenson Fund for underwriting this program. Uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to tonight's recorded program, as well as additional information and materials. Uh, if you could just leave us on, on one last note, which is, um, what was the response to your January 5th essay in the New York Times? It's a great, it, that's a really great question because um, we were chatting about this just a little bit before the Q&A. I write a lot for the public. I've written in a lot of, a lot of outlets or a couple of dozen op-eds just in the last year. And that op-ed is the only op-ed, it's the largest audience I've written for in the New York Times. It's the only op-ed I've ever written that I didn't get a single negative Piece of feedback. Not, I usually get hateful phone calls, hateful emails, threats that have to be investigated, sometimes, not always, thankfully, uh, all kinds of awful things, as you can imagine, and nothing. It was total crickets on the negative side. On the positive side, you know, it got picked up. I was on CNN, on MSNBC a couple of times. Uh, I was um, interviewed for a documentary that I'll actually run tomorrow night, February 3rd, on Paramount Plus called Indivisible. Healing, healing from Hate, which is uh, the fifth episode of a series of six. Um, so a lot of a lot of emails, a lot of actually a lot of medical doctors writing to me, um, saying they appreciated the metaphor and thought that it was a really good uh, way to think about it, based on the way that their own views about medical treatment have changed uh, to support a more public health oriented approach. So I was, I kept, I keep, I'm still waiting. I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop, thinking like, where are all the 
were all the mad people <laughs> because they usually uh, they usually are there, but for some reason it didn't um, it didn't anger anyone. And I'm hopeful too that that might be a sign that people are receptive um, because there certainly was a lot of positive feedback. People are receptive to the idea of intervening earlier, and people are worried about what they're seeing happening around them. Uh, that is, that is a positive note that I'm glad that we could finish on. Uh, uh, Dr. Milagers, thank you so much for joining us and sharing uh, your knowledge and, and your ideas on how we can confront this growing uh, level of extremism in our country. I want to thank uh, our ADL board chair, Karen Westall, and I also want to thank uh, the ADL team, uh, Margie Ulevin, Dina Marks, uh, and Lisa Stone for their work on tonight's program. And uh, most importantly to you, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, doctor, and good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.